the sports network. Awesome. I think we are live-ish. It says redirecting. <laughs> that the sound of someone chasing a dog or something? Is that what that was? <laughs> Someone's like... <laughs> going off. Like it. Oh, we got kids in the skate park. Okay. And being noisy right out here, so... Well, that's a good background noise. It's a heavy noise. noise. That's a heavy yeah. Noise. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, hey... Welcome to the Axe Shred Talk. Um, we are live here, and uh, Axe is a global network of action sports ministries, and our mission is to connect leaders who are making disciples of Jesus in action sports. Our goal with this Shred Talk is to gather people around a conversation that will help validate your calling to action sports ministry. Uh, we want to try to help share resources and ultimately grow your leadership. So we'd like everybody to be involved in this conversation, but obviously to help facilitate that a little bit better, uh, we've asked a few representative leaders to be on the call, um, but please join in with comments and questions and invite others to the Axe Facebook group. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to maintain a healthy marriage and family while in ministry leadership. But before that, uh, I want to have each of our participants introduce themselves share your name where you're from uh what action sports you're involved in that kind of stuff anybody can jump in ladies first right okay <laughs> <laughs> put me on the spot <laughs> well my name is Solve. um my husband and i live in san diego california and we uh work with the nonprofit christian surfers Nice. Awesome. Hi, my name is Gil, other half, and uh, I've been involved with Christian Surfers since it began in Cronulla, Australia in the late 70s. So that's a while. Yeah. <laughs> and Brett here, um, involved with Christian Surfers and also in helping facilitate and encourage other action sports ministries. And we live just south of Sydney, uh, a little town called Coldale. My name is Paul Anderson, and I'm living in Portland, Oregon, where things are crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I work at Skate Church, a ministry to skateboarders, um, evangelism, discipleship. I'm married to my wife, Heather, for 30 years, and I've got eight kids, believe it or not. So. Wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brian Sumner from Liverpool, England, probably have the funniest accent. Uh, live in Huntington Beach now and basically was a skateboarder professionally and then came to faith. And our marriage had failed. God redeemed us, put us back together. And pretty much since then, it's just been jumping into every kind of ministry, whatever level of action sports and helping, you know, pastor a church locally here. And really the focus is missions, marriages, ministry, just whatever the Lord's doing, jumping into things like this and being encouraged by you guys and encouraging. So, amen. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you all for being here, taking time out to share your experience, your expertise, and maybe even hopefully some of your failures, you know. Uh, but uh, marriage and, and ministry um, sometimes conflict. And I feel like this is, it's such an important topic, even in my own experience, like um, the demands of ministry leadership can put a strain on your marriage and they can put a strain on your family. And so I'm excited to hear from each of you about some stories, um, uh, the struggles that you guys have come through uh, and how you've, how you've overcome. So I'll jump right in uh, with our first question here. What is the difference between juggling uh, family and mission versus being a family on mission. So I'll say that again, just to clarify it a little bit more. What's the difference between juggling family and mission uh, versus being a family on mission? I got a couple of comments about that one. I think I wrote that question, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, um, I feel like a lot of people, especially um, many people start action sports ministry or are passionate about this sport as a single person, mm -hmm. you get involved with it. And then there's a almost assumption that, well, 
you're either going to do that mission and action sport or you're going to have a family and be married. You can't do both of them at once. It's one or the other. Uh, so I found a lot of people moving on from our Christian surfers group once they got married or had family because they saw them as two separate worlds and you couldn't have the two overlap. So I think it's a massive difference. Um, either you've got to choose one or the other or you actually are in a family context and you sort of switch one off then switch one on. So you're jumping between two worlds. But that third option of being a family on mission is more about integrating this together. And I know for mm-hmm. Gil and I, even when we had kids, we said, well, we're not going to stop doing mission just because we've had kids. The kids are going to mm-hmm. fit in with us as a family on mission uh, rather than we're going to fit just our mission around family and have to stop doing that. So uh, I like that concept that you could be a family on mission, not having to choose between family or mission and switching between those worlds. It's more about integrating. Mm. Yeah, that's good. How about the rest of you? How, how have you seen that play out in your own uh, experiences? I'll go if you guys are waiting. Him, you know, it, it, it's exactly as Brett said. I mean, God didn't call just one of us; He called both of us. We are one. And um, Genesis says there was no suitable helper, so God brought the woman to man, and it, it's a total team effort. And um, I would hate to think that you know. If I came in the surf ministry or skate ministry under Brad or Paul, suddenly when I'm married, it automatically means I don't do this. I would say more. It's growing, obviously, if time, money, resources permit, but then raising up those kiddos into it. I mean, we all know amazing people who are in the 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, Brent, you just hit 61. Hallelujah. Look how long you've been doing this. Amen. But you have got a, a, a reservoir of grandkids now in the action sports ministry that wouldn't have been there if Gil wasn't alongside of you and you guys didn't step into this. So to me, it's more just right there in Genesis where one, he gave me this helper to help me as I cover hair and help her with hair call. And we do this together. So, um, yeah, I believe it just strengthens your marriage too, especially when you're, you're blazing new trails, like everyone I'm seeing in here. I mean, for Paul to be in ministry way back then, and there's so many things that have, taken place only because the two were one so yeah yeah i think everything you guys just said um and then there's just a couple other thoughts i also have to add to it is like the guy who discipled me um when i was a new believer this is like 40 years ago i'm i'm old uh (laughs) I noticed that he he really loved the Lord and he discipled all these people who became missionaries and uh, evangelists, but his wife really wasn't that into it. And uh, so really he couldn't do what he wanted to do. And so I I share that example is reality is reality so in my case my wife was praying for a partner in ministry and then I asked her out the next day um <laughs> so she always wanted to minister the gospel make disciples and then we got married and so we did it together amen and I I like what both of you guys said of integrating so but it the second point I'll make is it changes with season so when when me and Heather were first married she did everything with me because we didn't have any kids so she went on the Canada trips the skate park trips cooked for the camps went to the demos you know and then we had kids and (laughs) she would bring the kids to the on the trips and cook and then we had so many kids that she was at home (laughs) praying for me (laughs) <laughs> so it, it got to a point where it would have just been insane. Um, but it, but her heart was always like, me and the kids are all about, mm. you know, husband and daddy being an evangelist to skaters. We go whenever we can. And when mm. he's gone, we're like all about it. And we want to hear the stories. But, but it's, you know, it's, that sounds all, all good and well. But actually, for some guys and a lot of us know this story or gals one of them's really fired up and the other one's kind of not into it and in that case 
<laughs> I think you'd have to really just be married to who you're married to and be a good spouse and just deal with that reality instead of trying to drag them along and having a big mm -hmm. conflict. So those are my thoughts. It's good. It's good. So that you have anything to add in there? Yeah, I think the first thing that came to mind is the difference between family in mission versus on mission is just like a mindset and a heart set. So mm -hmm. when Shane and I first got married, we, we had both just, even before we got married, we were talking about the future and we, we were both like what you were saying earlier was just, um, we're going to be a team. We're going to be a team for God, whatever that looks like we're in it mm -hmm. together. Um, and I know that's not the same for a lot of marriages. Um, I think marriage is a team, like you're saying, it's, it's, you become one, but, um, in the mindset of ministry, sometimes it feels like it can be the one person's thing, you know, like there's times where I, I felt like, oh, this is just Shane's thing. Like maybe I'm not supposed to, cause I don't like, you know, whatever doubts come into your mind. And then we just came back to that core belief of like, we're a team in this for Jesus. And so I think that's the mindset that switches over for, um, being a family on mission, um, is you're just thinking about like the, that core belief that you're in it together, whatever that is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So how let's get practical with this, the idea of being a family on mission or, you know, being a married couple that are on mission together. How have you seen that work, uh, really well together? Um, what are some of the benefits of being a family on mission or being a marriage on mission together? I want to say welcome to JP just joined in watching with us from Japan. It's pretty Yay. sweet. Awesome. <laughs> JP. <laughs> I'll just say two things that I already mentioned that work well is my wife Heather just got that heart that you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. like she wants skateboarders to come to Christ and be discipled. And so whenever she can, she uh, mm. just, you know, like would disciple the girls, you know, cause I'm not gonna disciple a girl that, that probably wouldn't go very well. So my <laughs> wife poured into the girls and um, then the other thing is, is as a family, we would try to bring our kids to the demos, the camps, the outreaches. Mm -hmm. And then they grew up around seeing people coming to Christ and uh, also seeing people's lives messed up and seeing people fall away from Christ. They just knew what mm -hmm. they grew up in the good and the bad of ministry. So uh, that's what comes to mind. Yeah. And Johnny, you said things that, that really work together. And I just want to boast in the women, you know, um, because of our story of separation and coming to faith and being remarried. Um, I know everyone here can just say, like, when your wife's on the same page, there's nothing as empowering. You know, yeah. and, Paul, and Paul, you said this, you know, there's so many men that run off with ministry. And it's I'm sure all of us have achieved some kind of relevance and something, whatever, like the shiny object that ministry can become that God. And if I go and say, I want to reach more skaters for the Lord, but neglect my wife at home or my kids at home, um, if they're into it or not, that's never going to work. But for mm -hmm. me, just my wife wanting me to be doing what I'm doing, it's the biggest part of, of, of marriage. You know, when I'm sitting with couples, it isn't that she's attractive or she's doing this or she's doing that. It's when she is on the same page as you, it's the most empowering thing. If she can't make it. And some of you who know my wife, you know, when we'd miscarried or when her ears kind of had gone crazy, she hasn't been on a, on a plane in like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I'm the guy flying out to places for two or three days. I'll never be gone so much to where, and I said this to myself from a preacher years ago, um, that he would never be away so much that his kids resent God because dad's gone with his ministry. So my wife doesn't get to go all these other places, but when we go around the U.S. and she goes and she's part mm -hmm. of it and she's ministering to the girls, just them being present, but also, and here's a big thing, seeing the office you're called into. When your kids see mom or dad doing what they're called to be doing, mm -hmm. um, it's the biggest witness. I, I, and women, listen to this. My friend planted a church in Costa Rica. It was a radical move. His Chilean wife, they planted a Calvary chapel. There's been so much fruit. And when I went over there, 
one of the first missionaries by myself, five days, 10 events. I just said in the email, I'll go. And he's like, why would you go? I said, well, the Lord said, go. And this amazingly strong and smart woman just said, Brian, what am I meant to be doing as his wife? And she's doing all these amazing things because he's the pastor in the front of the church, you know, and he's the one translating. And I just said, literally, you being his wife is the most empowering thing for him. When he's writing that sermon and, and he knows what you're doing, when you're the one there that you've got your arms around him, women are, are, have missed how powerful that is to a man. That's all we want. You know, that yeah. when it's not good for men to be alone, though we're married, we can live like that. So I'm just saying that to encourage the women being along and, and go have your ministry, go do what the Lord does. There's so much ministry to be done for women. So I just wanted to encourage people with that thought. Yeah. I would agree. I would say that things that have worked really well is probably when, you know, I'm thinking the opposite of what really hasn't worked very well. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. but I think, I think um, there's lots of things we could say, but I would, would say for Brett and I, it's worked really well when two things is respecting each other's gifting. Mm -hmm. um, so not forcing someone into a, you know, a square peg into a round hole. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that look like? Um, meaning my own gifting as well as personality. So um, Brett, Brett is Mr. Quantity. So he, he's making our world bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. I'm Mrs. Quality. So I'm just trying to make it. <laughs> I'm like, give me less people and I go deeper. Um, I just go wider. He just goes wider. <laughs> and so to, to know that would be, um, you know, I will get overwhelmed with the amount of people that mm. can be in and out of our home and overwhelmed because I feel like I'm not ministering at any level of anything past on the surface, um, and Brett would be terribly bored if it was look, all looked my way. And, and so it's really worked well to respect um, how we're wired um, and, that, and how we're gifted. And so, and, and where is room for that for both of us in the ministry God's carved out? And so um, that's been very helpful, helpful to honour how God's wired us as well as how he's gifted us. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe say something about the difference between giving someone versus them being taken. So when you have opportunities to preach and go, I'm very happy to give you away to those things because mm. that's your calling. I yes. don't feel it's been, I don't resent it feeling like you've been taken from me because I'm really happy to see you do that and you've had to think that through with me too. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, it's it's releasing each other in, in where we see God has really gifted us, and um, and sometimes for us that hasn't necessarily been Christian surfers, um, mm. so, so we can live not separate but some parallel lives. For instance, with me with preaching or the work I do in education, mm. is is Brett really honouring that and saying you need to be freed up, and freed up would often be who's going to um, have the children. I mean. Fathers don't babysit, they father. So who's, who's going to care with children and, and how, how are we going to do this juggle? Um, and so so probably what was said earlier, that's very empowering to see that it's um, sometimes women are seen as the gap fillers, you know, mm. filling the gaps. Um, and, I, and I think we can do better than that. Mm. Thank you for saying father's father and not babysit. <laughs> I just mean to keep them alive, right? Keep yeah. Them alive. <laughs> and he's uh, the uh, the children. Oh, there's a father. <laughs> Old baby children. <serum. laughs> uh, Allison is on here. She's saying this is so good. Thank you all for sharing so much. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question that I want to kind of lead into this next question here. Um, We've been talking a little bit about the good um, and how, how we've seen marriage and family work on mission. Um, let's shift gears to how it has not worked. Um, so uh, Tony or Yuli, I don't know which one, but they wrote in here, you know, with ministry and marriage, how do you navigate uh, seasons where you feel like you're not on the same page? So how do you, um, I guess like, in what ways have you seen marriage and family compete with ministry? And then how do you navigate that, especially when you're in a leadership role? I'll give an example. So uh, there was a missions trip that I was leading uh, and I was preparing to go on this mission trip. I got a team of people that are depending on me to go. 
Um, and we've been planning and preparing and all this stuff. And a few days before my wife uh, was having a lot of anxiety and panic and just wasn't feeling right. We had just moved into a new house. And so it was like, she wasn't feeling comfortable and she was being attacked spiritually. And so now I'm with looking at this going, what do I do? Like, like we're leaving on Friday and it's, it's Tuesday and she's falling apart and our kids are like, what's going on. And how do you manage that when you're in a leadership position um, and in marriage and family, and that's competing with mission? How do you, how do you manage through that? And how have you seen maybe some stories from your own lives? We know we all have lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everybody's quiet. <laughs> Which one do I pick? Call us out if you want. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say what my my problem when I was younger is I want to do everything, and mm -hmm. I neglected Heather and the kids, not royally like. You know, I, I'm not in like major depression, looking back, messing up my family. <laughs> but if you were to ask Heather, like I leaned way too heavy on her when I was younger. And it's because of what Brian said, it's the ego thing. Like somebody invites you to do something, guys want to be cool, you want to go do it. And like you just, you're like where a lot of times your wife will have a a heart for the family and healthiness and you're just like trying to do some more ministry accomplishment and it's messed up so <laughs> I um I would burn my wife out being gone and then the other thing is that I learned the hard way is just because your wife's super godly and will do it doesn't mean that's the right thing. So <laughs> when I was younger, just because Heather was really sturdy and tough, I would just let her do a ton of stuff. And then mm. as we got to about the fourth kid, she's just like blew the whistle and said, dude, like, and she pointed out a lot of selfishness in me, which I'm not going to name it all up because you guys won't listen anymore. But uh <laughs> But I had to grow up like like one thing at a time paradigm switch where your wife will just say, dude, you're you're just not engaging or you're sitting around or you're not helping. Mm. And then it would make me mad because I'm selfish. But then I would talk to the Lord about it and repent and then make a decision. OK, dude, help out at how the house stay home more. <laughs> spend more time and I and I would make the adjustments as I went or it would have been bad so that's my thought <laughs> you know um Paul Washer said something years ago that when I was first kind of coming to faith really spoke and it was just that you know if, if you're in a boat with your family and you're paddling along and the boat goes down as you guys are sinking the first person you should save is your wife because she's mm -hmm. your first sheep and I'm mm -hmm. guessing for most of you, you know, surf and skating, you're all good. You can swim, you're good. And though we grab the kids, the point is Tracy's my first, you know what I mean? So for you, Johnny, to be like, hey, I've planned this team. I've got this mission. But my wife, God doesn't need you to go travel to get the God points to feel like the ministry's going further. If your wife's at home freaking out, granted, she could have over exaggerated, but you're the one there to be loving Knowing someone like you, you definitely have disciplined people around you that can man the camp when they went away. I don't need to ask you if you went or not. I probably know. Um, but, but that's it. You know, um, I say this because of the, of the cheesiness of, the, I said, the shiny objects, the skate career and that. You think you're going to gain this by, by reaching these goals. And the second I came to faith, it was like, that doesn't really matter. I just want to navigate what God has today. And until you really put it all on the altar, still work harder at it. You know what I mean? It's like, what if we suddenly... I talked about my wife's mom having ALS. What if heaven forbid something happened? The first sheep's my wife, my kids, my family. Um, and I think, again, it's just juggling that listening. And I need to get better at listening. I'm sure my wife would say the same thing if we were here, but it's just that being one. Um, and the negative is that men, and, and we need to hear this, when marriages get stale, men can go make money or build the house or go more places and feel the satisfaction and that's where temptation comes in. I mean, you hear about these multi-church pastors who suddenly 
do meth and hook up with dudes. It sounds stupid, but these weird things happen. It's because they're chasing the idol, they're chasing the power, or the mom no longer gets the love from the dad. Mm -hmm. It's just out of the kids or, or the, the things of this world. And so it's just getting back on the page. And honestly, it's just being as deep as you can be in ministry, loving each other and loving others. So hope that makes a sense to someone. But you guys know my sermon is always just the Great Commission. We're living that. God's got stuff for us to do. And that can be abiding at home for seasons as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll say one little thing that's very quick. When I realized I was blowing it, <laughs> you can't do anything about what you did wrong. From that point forward, you would, this is, you would think this is super obvious, but I'm a slow learner. I would, every time someone asked me to do anything or I had this new thing, I was skate camp or whatever, I would sit down with Heather and go, hey, sweetheart, what do you think? Should I say yes? Should I try this? And we would decide together as a family what I was going to do and what I wasn't. And I would listen to her. Amen. Yeah. That's good. Because then it was her. Then it was her fault. Yeah. <laughs> so, Adam uh, listened to Eve dog. though, so it wasn't so good. <laughs> my dog is nagging us to death. The fourth child. <laughs> my my dog is too. <laughs> yeah, it's just like come on, I don't Maybe they're shouting to each other. They can hear each other. <laughs> <laughs> they're just communicating. Uh, um, I was just gonna say. I think Shane and I, our biggest struggle in ministry is saying no to things. We both are just big yes, yes people. And so um, whether that's doing the ministry stuff that we're doing that's together, or our ministry stuff that we do that's separate, all of a sudden we've like seen ourselves get into times where we're both saying yes to so many things. And then all of a sudden we're, we just look at each other and we're like, oh, what, how are we doing? I don't even know. Um, and then that's like kind of where all of a sudden like you feel not disunity but a little bit of that when something comes up and you both have to make a decision on that and then you realize you have you're maybe like what the question was not seeing the same or not on the same page um we've come to that point a ton like there was a time in our life where um we just had people over at our home every single night of the week every single night until like one in the morning two in the morning um and it was just like a small group that we were meeting with and I got burnt out way before he did because he's similar <laughs> to Brett and I'm similar to Gil. <laughs> um, and it was just a constant uh, flow of people coming in our home. But I, I loved it because I love hospitality and having them over. But we just realized like all of a sudden we both had gotten burnt out. I was before. So then I started kind of pushing back a little bit. And then, and then he finally got to that point and we realized like our community was actually suffering. The ones that we were supposed to be doing ministry for and loving on was suffering because our marriage was not at its best. And so I think like whatever, just to echo what everyone's already saying is just taking that time for each other and knowing that your, your husband or your wife is your first ministry, like your first person to love on and to give time to. So whether that literally just being like, you can be open with the ministry that you're doing and just say like, Hey, we need to take time for each other. Like we need, I need to take time for my marriage and just go and do a bunch of stuff you love doing, like have fun with each other and, just remember the fun, <laughs> like put aside. So Shane and I now have like a designated night of the week where we just have a date night. And that, that night is just put aside. Nothing can come in between it. It's just our night to just spend with each other and to get close again and um, communicate and be like, get back on that same page or discuss why we're not on the same page. And since we started doing that and just that alone, the other, the other things have helped too, but just that little bit has helped a ton in um, how we do ministry. Yeah, something that you said that caught my attention was that when your um, when your marriage isn't like a hundred, it affects your ministry and impacts your ministry. And so um, I've experienced that too, where it's like, yes, you're if you're not like if my wife and I are, are having a, an argument or a fight or something like that, and then I got to go and like teach Bible study that night, Bible study is <laughs> yeah. not going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it takes seriously hard work. I remember Gil hitting the wall and they say time flies and this clock crashed against the wall next to me. And initially I thought maybe she doesn't like that clock. And then it was maybe she doesn't like me. And she thrown it at me. 
And I realized, representing time. Another time. another night you're out without telling me, Mr. Yes. Spontaneous. Yes. <laughs> Four nights in a row, and I thought I would have a night off. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, and it think, suddenly dawns on the mail that maybe something's wrong. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, and sometimes it's you know I you know remember to try and get things in order for a couple of weeks and then the old habits would creep in and uh, mm. would you know point that at again and sometimes it takes something pretty radical so we did a year where we got some good marriage counselling and I committed to one year with no night meetings for one year just to Amen. change the habit we had two small children we were strained and stretched. And it was a season to really invest and fight for our marriage. And it required pulling out of all the volunteer things I did. I disappointed a whole bunch of people. Got some Stop being elder counseling. at the church. Yeah, Stop doing about 20 things. Yeah. But they didn't throw clocks at you, did they? No. Pardon? They didn't come throw clocks at you, though, did they? No. no. And I missed him. He's only two metres away. It was very disappointing. Well, next time, no. Hey. <laughs> You know, what you're saying, and and this is what people got to hear, because this is so important. When we were building our marriage, relationships are about relating, and you fall in love because you relate, and you decide to have kids because you relate, and you can go through the you-know-what because you relate. And whether it's a clock or, you know, Paul, your wife telling you whatever, or I wish my wife could be here. I find it kind of humorous when you expose your struggles because all those Christians who think we're just – perfect because we're invited on here and we have you know a marriage book here and some sermons around no christianity is god is good and he's constantly working on us but uh, it's just relating i would hope that any of our spouses could hear this and be motivated by all that we're saying because i know i am and that's what we're just relating in is god's always there to just stir up our marriages and Mm -hmm. it's powerful stuff guys blessing me yeah and I, i would say that's been very key because he's, he's the, um, it, it has to be all about him. And so, so where it's not worked has been ministry can be 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so I remember in counselling feeling like, you know, God's our boss. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Where, how do you knock off? Or the needs are always <laughs> there and, and, and Brett will love to respond to all the needs and to say no means people are going to be disappointed, people are going to be hurt, people are going to feel like you don't love or care. And, mm-hmm. and so the quality time person um, on one hand would throw a clock on another hand say, no, you can't say no because, you know, they're struggling. And, and so trying to work out that um, you're not the saviour of the world, um, God is, and how to set boundaries. Amen. And the other thing that was helpful was realising there's seasons. So now if things are really have seasons of busyness. It's different now because we don't, we're not raising children. They're all adults. So you feel like as the primary carer that I do get a break or I can knock off or I do have more agency. But um, I, I think it's that sense of realising when there's seasons to also trust God that someone like me would want to control. When things are out of control, I want to control. Um, and just go, it's out of control, but I can trust God in this. What we had to work through is Brett would go, oh, she's doing really well. Oh, the season now becomes a lifestyle. <laughs> you know? okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> the season's not going to become a lifestyle. And so um, working out as well for me to not always control. But can I trust God in what is a season that isn't necessarily what we've chosen? There's just a lot of need sick children. Um, there's a lot going on and we can really trust God in this, but um, not to be pushed to the point where resentment or um, the tensions in the marriage means you're ineffective yeah. as a parent, yeah. let alone in ministry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I, I left a kind of a cliffhanger with this story about me going on this trip and stuff. But you did, you did, especially all the women are like, what happened? What happened? Well, just so to wrap that back together, my, my wife is incredible and she, we had made the decision together that I would go on this trip and that I would lead this trip. And she said, you need to go on this trip. Like I believe in it. It's okay. just at the same time, I'm struggling, I'm being attacked. And so for me going through that process and understanding that, um, it, it's, it's working together and, and realizing that she's going through stuff as well and, and leading my family, leading my wife, 
um, through the struggle, um, not abandoning uh, the calling that God has given me um, for uh, just to pursue our marriage, but also not abandoning our marriage uh, to pursue the, the calling that God has on my life, like yeah. doing doing what God has called us to do and leading our marriage, like through some of those really challenging, difficult times and some of those difficult questions, if that makes sense. Oh. I thought you were going to say, so she went with you and you just flipped it on with, everyone. <laughs> we thought about that too, but it, we had kids and you know, it's a whole, whole nother deal. But uh, I went and it was difficult being away from each other, especially with all that stuff going on. But um, she believed in it and was praying for me as I went and the, the ministry went well, we came back and our marriage as well. And, you know, God worked through all of that, but it was a good learning moment for me. Um, we have a ton of questions that have been coming in. Um, here's, here's a, a quick one. This one, uh, it says, is it advisable to uh, do your ministry outside of your city, leaving your newly wedded wife and newly born baby, question mark. Depends on the wife and the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Brett went away for two weeks when our little one was six weeks old. Um, we, we, um, we find every season of life we got to talk about it, so... So, so probably two weeks when we were married and then once the second child came along and went, mm, you know, we kind of think a week's great because Brett's so busy, I have downtime. So I'm like, mm -hmm. when are you going away next, love? You know, so I can relax. <laughs> and, uh, and then the second week I'm actually bored and miss him terribly. And the third week I'm like, Argh! and so Brett times it beautifully around the 10-day mark Sweet when he comes home to me saying, um. And so we talk about that and don't impose that on other people. It's like, that's what works for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our firstborn cried all the time. So it was pretty demanding. And so we had to rethink what that looks like. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think, think you can't impose rules. <laughs> You've got to go, yeah. that, 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 um, that could work, especially if all the grandparents come in or you have help, or that could be, you know, very, yeah. very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. you got you got to talk about it. Yeah, different marriages require different amounts of attention and maintenance compared to others. So I've got friends who can't possibly imagine being away from their partner for a weekend at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think I think it is juggling what you're doing. Like I know for a lot of us, you're getting flown into places to you know for Paul building ramps, or maybe it's speaking at a conference or doing it you know you're coming back, but I'd say for whoever's asking, if you have something planted outside of where you live, where you go, and you will spend a lot of time where you don't have the freedom to go back unless you're on a trip that's one off once in a while, I'd just say, you know, like I said in Genesis, it's not good that man's alone. You can be married and feel alone, and I like my schedule so random that I know if I'm distancing from my wife, if we're so busy, there's so much. We need the time just to be together, you know, going on walks, going on bike rides, talking through stuff, not doing anything. I can't tell you how many times we'll go to plan a date night and my wife will drop the kids off. And by the time she comes back, we're so tired. We'll just sit on the couch and do nothing and zone out. So I hope anyone listening is hearing it's all about your personal rhythms, but talking about it, relating on it. And mm -hmm. yeah, we're homebodies. We're corny for being just around the house doing nothing, you know, so yeah. I just remembered, gee, when you get old, your memory's bad. Our baby wasn't six weeks old. We were six weeks married. Oh, I, don't ah. think, I, I don't think there would be any possibility Brett would go away for two weeks with a six-week-old baby. He <laughs> 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 sits there and smiles instead of going, that's not right, love. <laughs> well, he didn't, remember, he didn't remember anyway. Yeah. <laughs> he probably, he probably would, exactly. so I would have been going, not on your life. <laughs> Um, it, it, another question that came in is what are some practical ways to put your marriage first? Um, and, and that, uh, how do you manage conflicting priorities and demands of your family? Somebody mentioned date night, um, you know, thinking through talking through and scheduling, like 
how long can we be away from each other? Um, what are some other practical ways that like if a husband and wife are sitting at home right now watching this thinking, how are we going to actually do this today? What would be like a checklist of like, let's sit down and what are some of the things that you guys have done besides date nights? And yeah. Well, if you want it, I can give you a really practical stuff like for our traveling, we worked out that we kept, even as an international director, as the Australian director, um, we kept my time away from six to eight weeks a year. So I, I had to visit every continent every year for 15 years, but I kept it at six to eight weeks away. I tried to be away no more than a week, 10 days. Um, especially not two weekends away because the weekends were pretty demanding. We would try to stagger the trips. I would get in early because lots of people will plan your life for you unless you get in first and make the plans. Mm. And uh, we would endeavour to have a date day before I went away and uh, have some time after when I got back. So by having that staggered thing, no more than this time, maximum time away, date day before, no expectation of sex on the first night back, just to keep uh, pressure off. So um, those are practical things that work for us. Uh, even, you know, it's been 35 years of full-time ministry at a national level. Um, and we're able to live through that and raise three kids and be married for 36 years. And a very practical thing was because of Brett's spontaneity, um, which I did not want to crush, uh, was there something delightful about that as well? And you find what you need. So <laughs> that was also good in some ways for me. And, and my organisation was good for him. But we, we, you know, you have phones now, but we had two months calendar on the fridge. And I basically said to Brett, if it's not on, then it's not on. Um, <laughs> which, which just meant that um, whatever you have on, just put it up there so I at least know what a week's going to look like. And then it also helped Brett. He'd look at it and go, oh, there's lots of, lot, like, lots of orange stuff there, which is all the stuff he's out or away. Mm -hmm. So visually could see that even though he didn't feel the impact of that, he could see visually what it looked like. Um, and then I could make plans. So things like I could plan things that often sometimes didn't factor in, like friendships as a couple, <laughs> um, see people that have nothing to do with ministry just for the joy of seeing people, um, which often got drop, dropped very quickly because, oh, I didn't realise you had something on, so we can't do that or we can't go away with friends. Or um, That was very, very helpful for, for even my mental well-being to just go, yay, we've got a free Saturday and I can look forward to it. Expectations. Expectations are everything. Yeah, if it's not on, it's not on. <laughs> I, and it's a good one right there. Paul, you were going to say something. Well, I think he just said it like we would schedule it together on the calendar where you could see it. And we would write down the, you know, the dates that Heather would have with kids and the dates that I would have with kids, you know, the dates we had with each other and the family days. And that would be on the counter, the calendar too. And sometimes things come up and you move it, but it, you make sure you get yeah. time with your kids, time with your wife and time as a family, you know? So, and then the other one was that, you know, I've learned over the years, you know, it's all about relationship as Brian keeps saying. And so what I do with Heather to this day, all the time, every single day I ask her, how are you? And I listen to how she is. And then I also ask her, how is it going? And then I name off, you know, I have eight kids. So I don't do this every day, but every week, probably this happens once or to three times where I'll say, how's it going with Berkeley, Darius, Malcolm, Haley, Mariah? I won't name them all off, but and then I'll let her explain to me how it's going with each one of our kids. And then if things come up where she wants me to talk about how we're gonna think that's great or work, figure something out, mm -hmm. I do that because if she, if she knows that I'm entering into her life and the life of each kid and I'm participating, she's happy. If I'm just on my own program and she's like doing all that, then mm -hmm. no good. And so that's, 
it's an easy thing, but just go through every kid's name with your wife and her and just listen. We, we've, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, how to do it in marriage. How do you do it with your kids individually? You got eight, so you got the most experience, I think. So, you know. So whoever walks in the door, that's the kid you hang out with right then. Yeah. Go yeah. The <laughs> um, you know, when, when we'd miscarried and my mom had passed away and we transitioned to church, we were in like a crazy season where my wife was hurt. And um, she put so much faith in, I think, leadership in the church and having her own mother and dad separate. It caused her to kind of have this gap. And this is when we really got super serious rebuilding the marriage as well. And one of the things we found, and it was, it's corny, but there was a James Robson book, whatever, Dobson, called Nightlight. And I'd just been reading how, look, people spend hours a day in the gym or hours a day, you know, selling houses or surfing or doing whatever we do but we rarely spend more than 15 minutes focused on the spouse. And I bring up that book or any book that just withdrawing for 15 minutes and having a conversation, talking and engaging. And I mean, pursuing them, romantic, <clears throat> whatever, that consistent cycle of seven days, 14 days, 21, that built, especially those who are struggling right now. I mean, people need to give that much time to their marriage. When you think when a marriage fails, where you live generally changes how often you see the kids generally changes yet we don't give more than 15 20 30 minutes a day to that other person so it's just about being intentional and as a man if you can't stir yourself up to pursue her see how beautiful she is you know she's the object of perfection as far as a woman in this world she's god's daughter so i just get encouraged and stirred up and just pursue her that way hopefully she does it to me you know i think i'm 240 by now i don't know what this is on my chin um but i'm saying that to say it's just being intentional, you know, daily. And that's just marriage, you know, fighting for it the way Christ did for his church, died for us. So with with children, I, I you know, we had our nine-year-old, ten-year-old, I'm not sure when, how Jackson was when he put his arms around Brett and said, Dad, I'm never gonna be a surfer. Um and uh and he was comforting Brett. Sweet. He was always a 40-year-old trapped in a young body. I think there are challenges when your whole life and everything you breathe at the time was surf ministry and surfing and you have a child who feels like that's not where they fit. And so very, very important that he didn't therefore feel like he was a nominally in our family or what that looked like. I think we navigated that well. He was a computer gamer, which did your head in. Um, and so he still has a place and what does that look like and where is his own area of influence and strengths and giftings and to not ever see that neglected. So the other two just fitted in really well, still do, love the tribe, love the ministry. Um, whereas for Jackson, it was really being taking that quite seriously. That he's not going to feel left out. That, that's very important with our kids. Um, yeah, when it's a lifestyle and it might not be his lifestyle. <laughs> Yeah. He was into the arts, reading, film, theatre. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Muted, Johnny. Yeah, I hear you, Johnny. <laughs> Praying. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what for <laughs> us? <laughs> yes. Oh, Lord, help these people. I know. Uh, <laughs> what? What are uh, what about some advice for somebody who isn't married yet or isn't um, maybe they're dating or maybe they're engaged? How would you what would you advise as they're entering into the mission field or as they're entering into marriage and family? Like how how do you you know start on the right page? I mean, I can tell you one thing. When I was 23 or something like that, or 21 or 22, I was dating a girl and I told her I wanted to go into inner city youth ministry. And she was like, you could tell she didn't. And, but I thought she was cute and I wanted a girlfriend. So I just kept going out with her. And I praise the Lord that she broke up with me. Because I was kind of just spun out. 
on on her. But I look back mm. now, you know, when when I after her, I, when I would date girls, I would see if they were down to do ministry to crazy kids. And if they didn't want to do that, then I needed to find something else to be doing. So that I, that's real practical. But, <laughs> you know, people are different. And if they don't want to, you know, whatever your mission is as a man or woman, you should be looking for someone to partner with who's at least embraces it and is down with it. Maybe that's not their specific niche, but they're, they can't be bummed on the idea. Mm -hmm. I know that's the, the most obvious thing someone could say, but my ministry is called Captain Obvious. They got to be down with the ministry is what you're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nah, that's good. Do you, um, I, I'm conscious of our time here. Do you guys have any books, podcasts, mentors, like uh, things that have built your uh, marriage, your family, um, things that have really, uh, yeah, just spoken into that part of your life that you would encourage people to, to read or learn more from? We found love language is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think you can feel like you're working hard at loving someone and miss them. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the early years of our marriage. Um, so we found that very helpful. Um, I'm not being cheesy, but I do find reading God as father and mother, you know, he's, he's, that's been helpful as a parent, just when I read my Bible with that lens to see, to see his pursuit his persistence, who, who he is. Um, you know, when I read the Bible with that lens, I've learned a lot. <laughs> his relationship, how he treats people, that's been helpful. But love, I could say a lot, but love languages was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like a lot of the stuff Vody Bochum did as well. Um, he just unpacks a lot of the roles in the family. I'm not saying I agree with every single thing, but just... Um, challenging men to really kind of defend the home and raise up their daughters in a way, you know, that they understand who they are or the men to respect women. And I know we could go into all this, but it seems like every year it's so far ahead where people aren't even trying to figure out who they are in, in the Lord. Sometimes they're just kind of cruising through, you know, I mean, if you hear the men in this, what we're really saying is we have to learn to kind of go from being boys to men by listening to our brides and using the word of God, normally coming through our wives so um, Vody was just very serious and bold. And I kind of like sermons that are more like stand on your toes. Like if you drop it on that wave, you're going to die. Or if you jump on that handrail, it's not going to be good. And so here's what the word says. That's kind of how I like that John the Baptist kind of right to you, you know. So that um, and just good people around, you know, older, older people who have been through it. I mean, I can just hear some of the wisdom here and experience. You can know everything, but if you haven't walked through it. Um, it's great just hearing, oh, this is what we went through. Oh, okay. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, I would suggest the book Wild at Heart. It's written for men, but as a woman to read it, it's awesome. <laughs> it's just super eye-opening to see how the man's heart has been created and just kind of like that original design of a man. And it's really inspiring to know how to encourage your husband through that when there's just that adventurous spirit, especially when it comes to adventurous spirit in ministry um, and how to inspire that. And it also talks to men about how to love their wife too, and just to see a woman in that way. Um, so that book is awesome. And then um, Boundaries is also a great book, <laughs> especially going into ministry, whether you're dating or you are married and have a family, knowing how to have boundaries is a great tool. <laughs> Yes. Paul, you got a lot of books behind you. Any of those good? <laughs> if I named out books, you guys, they would be out of print. <laughs> uh, you know, that love languages thing is good. I really don't know what books I should suggest for people today because the books I have are old. So uh, a book that helped me is called The Complete Husband. And it just tells guys to lead and love and understand their wives and not be selfish. And I've gone through it two or three times with different groups of men and all of us just get together and get drink coffee and donuts and get busted and then go home 
and learn how to be a better husband. So I'll say that one, but it's like that book's so old. But it's still in print. It's I I don't know. It's called it's by Lou Priolo, and it's called The Complete Husband. Yeah. It's old. Uh, but any book that may that ha is a couple book that gets us communicating, listening, and understanding each other, I say that's a good book. And a small group. I'm uh, part of a guy, say younger married guys group and they yes. just love getting together and personally gleaning experiences yep. together most men get together to lower the bar to get guys together to lift the bar to be a better man better husband better father and do it in community a small group yeah, yeah that's good i i read my wife and i read a book uh before we got married it's called love and respect I don't remember who it was by, but it was very impactful for our marriage. And I actually proposed with the ring. I cut out the center of the book and put the ring inside there. Uh, <laughs> and, well, we had two of them. So I figured, you know, hey, but uh, yeah, it was a really good book. It, it, similar to love languages on the like, uh, you know men are obviously seeking respect and how to how my wife can respect me and then how i can love her and how it's it's similar things but it's just like different languages um and how to communicate in each other's language a little bit more uh super helpful yeah, and that was dr egrich right the book it was the white yeah and the, book, the big thick one yeah yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> just gotta get a, another meeting I'm just anticipating a clock coming in the screen right now. <laughs> yep. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, well, that's all the time that we have for today. I want to thank you guys for all sharing your wisdom, your insight. Uh, it's incredible. Um, and thank you for all of you that are uh, online commenting in questions and things like that. Let's keep this conversation going on the Facebook group, the Axe Facebook group. Um, let's keep talking about it. Let's keep asking questions. If you want to reach out to any of these uh, people, feel free to do that. I'm sure they would, you know, sit down with you, spend like hours uh, talking to you about marriage, family. Um, we will hold another shred talk coming up October 20th. If you want to set a reminder on your phone or whatever, um, we're going to be talking about how to actually share the gospel for real uh yeah so that's going to be really good uh, i'm excited um please let us know uh comments in the comments if you want to if there's anybody that you think would be really good at talking about that um please uh add their name in the comments so we can get them onto the panel for next time um thank you guys and blessings we'll talk to you all later Thank you. Thank God you. bless everyone. See you. Yeah, everyone.